Okay, welcome to module four of hand in hand training. And this one is entitled Being with a Person with Dementia Actions and Reactions. Have you heard that phrase that for every action there is a reaction? Yes. That's true with dementia care, too. It's true in life and it's true in dementia care. Okay, so the. Um, the, the premise of this is that, uh, that we just need to review about being present with people with dementia. And it means understanding things from their perspective, from their own perspective, not from yours, from theirs, being with them where they are. Remember we talked about validation? We will go to where they are. We will not ever bring them into our reality. And arguing with them will only make them resist more. It's recognizing them as a whole and unique individual. Just because there's something wrong with their brain does not mean that they are no longer who they are or who they were. Anybody in here have any sore muscles or sore, really, where, what, what muscle is sore? Every muscle. Every muscle <laughs> is sore. But that doesn't change who you really are, does it? It might change what you can do today, or what you do tonight, perhaps, but it doesn't change who you are. Just because you have dementia does not change who they are, who they really are. And then build on their strengths. Remember this morning I said, we don't care what they can't do. We sometimes have to recognize what they can't do, but we don't really care what they can't do. We only care what they still can do. And then we have to connect with them. So the objectives for this module are you will be able to understand the behaviors of a person with dementia as actions and reactions that are forms of communication. I would challenge you that if you have someone with what you consider to be a problem or an inappropriate behavior, they are reacting to something. It may very well be you with your approach. It may be something that happened five minutes before. It may be that they got something for lunch that they hate, right? One of the things uh, that I want you to know is that I think there are three things that you need to know about every elder that comes to your facility, and you need to know them almost immediately. The first thing is what's the most important thing in your life, in their life? What's the most important thing in their life? So what would we hear? If I ask you that, what would I hear? Children. Children. Spouse. Spouse. Pets. Pets. Sometimes I hear family, sometimes I hear faith, sometimes I hear coffee before I get up in the morning, those kind of things. Would it be important to the elder that is coming in here, because you know we've already established they didn't want to come, this was a bad day when they have to move into your facility. Nobody has it on their bucket list. Would it be good to know what that most important thing is so that you have something to share with them? Or you can talk about it because you know what's the most important thing. Second thing you need to know is what's not negotiable. We all have some non-negotiables in our lives, don't we? What, what's non-negotiable to you? The safety of your kids. So if you thought your kids were at home alone without you, you would be you would find a way, wouldn't you? So was Mrs. Caputo. That's not negotiable to her because her reality is her kids are home alone and she needs to get there. What's non negotiable to all of you? Cell phone. Cell phone. Non negotiable. <laughs> And, I, and that's okay these days. It's non-negotiable. Facebook and Twitter and all those things. Cool. Cool. So if you moved in here and somebody told you you couldn't do that, how would it feel? 
Yeah, you'd live. You'd find a way. Yeah. You would get out. Yeah. I, I read about an instant not too long ago that the um, elder had a cell phone. And it was the only way that she could communicate with her family. I think it was a daughter. And the staffs told her, if you don't stay up to take your meds before you go to bed, I'm going to take the cell phone. She didn't, they did. They took away her link to her family. It was the only link she had. Non-negotiable. What else? Um, being able to um, like go to church or go to a Bible study. My car, yeah. Your car. <laughs> And yours is going to church or your Bible yeah. study. Not going to a hymn sing here, although that's very nice. Right. You want to go to church. Yeah. So yeah, do no you one. think that when someone has dementia, <coughs> their faith needs are diminished? No. No. In fact, I would say that they're probably exacerbated. Because faith has been in their lives for all of their lifetime. It's a long-term memory. And it's what they've depended on. Anybody else have a non-negotiable? I have three. One of them is you won't hit me. I'm not sure, because I've never really been hit as an adult, but I think I'll hit you back. <laughs> and then you'll go to the phone and you'll call the doctor and you won't tell the doctor that you hit me first. And they'll give you an order for something because I'm aggressive. I have combative behaviors that'll go on my care plan. I don't drink because I cannot stand that fuzzy feeling in my head. You're gonna create that in me 24 hours a day. Yes? Don't tell me to calm down. Good. <laughs> oh, somebody tells me to calm down, it just makes me more mad. <laughs> or to relax. Yeah. I'm like, don't tell me to relax, I'm mad. You don't need to worry. Oh, who, who are you to tell me? And first of all, I can't stop it. And second, anyway, my second <laughs> non-negotiable has all everything to do with Paco. Don't even bring me to the dining room if you're having liver or spinach. I'm not coming. I don't like the smell. I don't like the look of it. I don't like any part of it. So if either you're going to give me something else to eat in my room or... I'm not eating. I don't care. I just don't bring me to the dining room. The third non-negotiable is my dog. You notice I didn't say my husband? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about him. We can negotiate, but not my dog. Because my dog needs me. Nobody else needs me. Nobody really. Since my children are grown, my hut, you know, nobody really needs me, but she needs me. So can I bring her? Yeah. yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need some help. She's a 53-pound black lab that sheds. <laughs> She's a girl, got the sweetest spirit of any dog I've ever known. Those are my three non-negotiables. I think anybody else have a different one? Nobody said... Well, I, I think I could add a fourth, and that will be Diet Coke. Because if you don't give me Diet Coke, I'm going to have a headache. If I have to have puree food, I'm not going to stay in my room. You might as well just put a few in too, then, because I ain't even care what. Let me choke, gag, whatever. <laughs> I want that bacon. Like you bacon want real, but you don't want pureed yeah, bacon, I huh? I want your runny eggs, smash that, whatever you want to do, so. Yeah. Pureed food is a non-negotiable for a lot of people. I wouldn't be thinking liquids either. Me neither. Mm -hmm. yeah, just let me choke off regular water. I've to try it before. <laughs> I hope you I'll have an advanced directive. Yeah, I'll sign the paper. Just let okay. me Okay. Okay. Just let me. I'm going to myself. Okay, the third thing I think you need to know when they come in is what's their comfort food. Yeah. Not their favorite food. Their comfort food. What food do you go to? when you're stressed. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. <laughs> Chocolate ice cream. Chocolate ice cream. All right. 
What? <laughs> anything chocolate. Yeah. Anything chocolate. <laughs> Room full of women, obviously. <laughs> and Paco. <laughs> What's your comfort food, Paco? Being a cook, I don't think I have any. Really? No comfort food. I bet we could find one. Usually we hear things that are very high in carbs. Mac and cheese, mashed potatoes and gravy, chicken and noodles. Mine is something completely different. My mom died when I was 19. She was 46. She died of invasive breast cancer that messed all over her body. <clears throat> and I'm an only child. At one point in my life, I was a, a red-headed only child. My dad threatened to put a warning sign on me. <laughs> my mom was my best friend. During high school and growing up, she was my best friend. And she knew all about me. So if I'd had a bad day, for dinner that night, there was a bowl of warm, homemade tapioca pudding with a little bit of whipped cream on top. Now, tapioca pudding is not my favorite food. Those little balls in there, they're bothersome to me. But when I eat tapioca pudding, I feel safe. So wouldn't it be nice if on that first day, you would serve me at the, at, for dessert a little bowl of warm tapioca pudding with a little bit of whipped cream on top. I would be, I'll tell you, if you serve me liver or spinach, I'm going to be on the phone to my kids saying, come and get me out of this hellhole. <laughs> if you give me tapioca pudding, I will be on the phone saying, it's going to be okay. It can make a difference to your folks with dementia. If your folks with dementia start having some escalated behaviors, what if I were that person and you would come and say, I know where there's some tapioca pudding. I may have I may be in mid to late to end stage dementia and still I think I will recognize safety with tapioca pudding. We had a lady like that. I started the dementia unit and she anything chocolate. She was staring at you and as soon as you said chocolate, her eyes got really big. And, <laughs> and she de she was not leaving <laughs> right. until she got chocolate. <laughs> right. So it made her actually feel better. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to get to, isn't it? So how many of you know your elder's comfort food? I don't want one. What is it? Chicken fried steak and mushroom. Chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes and gravy. Catfish. 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 Chicken beaner and onion rings. What? Chicken beaners and onion rings. Chicken fingers and onion rings. Chicken fingers and onion rings. Chicken fingers and onion rings. Makes puffs. them feel better. Cheese puffs. Makes them feel better. So do you use that as an intervention for your dementia behaviors? Because that's what we need to know them so well that we don't have to ask. And let me tell you, once they come in here and they're in mid to end to late stage or late to end stage <coughs> dementia, it's not the time to try and figure that out. You need to watch them. You also need to ask family. So anyway. So those are the three things I think you need to know about them when they come in. Okay. You're going to identify ways to prepare for, prevent, or respond to actions and reactions for a person in dementia. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about some non-pharmacologic interventions because this is not included in the PowerPoint, but I think it's important. We, were, we had a conversation earlier about running. What happens when we physically exercise? What? We increase our heart rate. We get tired. We do. We get a, a natural fatigue. Your lungs burn. <laughs> <laughs> Your lungs burn. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. We, we also get those natural endorphins. Endorphins. And endorphins are a natural high. They just elevate your mood. It becomes addictive. You know, marathon runners, if they don't run and they don't have that rush of endorphins, they get depressed. They physically change. So use physical exercise for your people with dementia as, as an intervention, as a prevention for behaviors. Get the endorphins running. They're natural. 
paint therapy, music therapy, there is so much research out now about the benefits of music therapy. The music center of the brain is in the temporal lobe. And no matter what, that center is not affected. So now make it the music that you they like. You mean they don't like rap? I don't. <laughs> if you would put rap on in my room, I think you would see me elevate. If you would put semi-classical, that kind of music on, I think you would see this. My husband, it will be classical music. You need to know what their preference is. You need to be asking as activity and social service. But she is not the person that's responsible for moments of pleasure for your elders. Everybody, especially your dementia elders. I agree with you. I know it. She agrees with me, <laughs> and she, I am her friend, probably for a wife. Her job as activity director is to plan the big things. We all do some big things. I heard some big plans going on tonight. Football games and movies and things like watching the Royals and all of those things. And that's her job, to plan some big things. But moments of pleasure for a person with dementia <coughs> is a very personal and individual thing that needs to be done by everybody. Hakos could certainly add to my pleasure sometimes just by sitting down with me and asking me if I want a Diet Coke. Could I drink a Diet Coke with you? That kind of thing would bring a moment of pleasure to me. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for moments. We're not looking for a lifetime of turning this thing around. We're not going to do that. Rocking chair. You have some rocking chairs here? They're kind of like rocking chairs. They rock, but they don't recline. No. So the University of Rockhurst did research. And when you rock for 15 minutes, <coughs> melatonin stays in your body for six hours. Melatonin, you all know what that is? It's a sleep enhancer. You go to the grocery store or the drugstore or Walmart or wherever you go, and you buy a little bottle, and it makes you go to sleep. It, it helps you go to sleep. So if you rock, if an elder with dementia rocks for 15 minutes, melatonin will stay in their body for six hours. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? And it's not a pill, and it's not, a, it's, it's not any pharmacologic intervention. It's just meeting them at their need. It's just knowing some things. Art therapy is also very helpful. Horticultural therapy, pet therapy is very, very important. I will tell you a story. I, I taught dementia in southeast Kansas, and um, at the end of each presentation, I give them my contact information, although you won't have my contact information. But I give them my contact information, hoping they won't call me. Well, they <laughs> did. And they had a very sexually aggressive man. He would walk up to somebody and touch them where they didn't want to be touched or grab them where they didn't want to be grabbed. And so what happens when we have that, when that happens to us? What do you we do? say something real nice. We've had one of those. Well, mm -hmm. staff yeah. eventually back up. They don't want to go close to them, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be touched or grabbed. <coughs> And they could not turn this thing around. So we talked through interventions, and oh yeah, we did that, we did that, we did that, we did this. And I finally said, do you have a pet, facility pet? Well, we've got this cat hanging around the back door. We've been thinking about getting it declawed and, and uh, bringing it in. And I said, well, as long as you're thinking about it, it won't hurt to try. I said, would you be willing to put it in his room? Put the litter box and the food, and you have to help him take care of it. Well, yeah, we'll try anything at this point because we don't want to have to involuntarily discharge him. They did. He has not had another behavior. Mm. He sits in the rocking chair and pets the kid all day. He just wanted touch. That's mm. all he wanted was touch, just kind, compassionate touch. He didn't know he was doing anything inappropriate. He didn't know he was scaring people. He didn't know he was intimidating them. He just wanted something to touch, something warm and alive. 
Now, will it work every time? Absolutely not. It won't. But it won't work this time. And we created pleasure for this man for a number of months. Think about what you're doing so that you can communicate with them. So let's talk about actions and reactions. An action is something you do, and a reaction is how you respond to what someone else did. And behaviors are all about actions and reactions. So the goal of this session is to look at an example of a specific and common action of a person with dementia. You ever have somebody that, I want to go home. I want to go home. I just want to go home. Yeah. Mrs. Caputo just wants to go home. What do you think about when you hear the word home? Warmth. Yeah. Warmth. Comfort. Comfort. Familiar. 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 Family. Family. All good things, right? So if you are in a place that you don't recognize as home, but you have a long-term memory of what home should be, do you see why someone might say, I want to go home? It's do you see why this place, this building, you must make it their home. It's not home-like. It will never be the same as where they lived before, but it is the only home they have and it's what you make it. Hey, what time you got, Arthur? 10 minutes, it's almost that time. Oh, thank goodness. If you told me it was one, I think I'd just collapse. I'm so beat. Kind of like yesterday, huh? And the I day before that, home. yep. I have to go home. Your turn. Sorry, I was here till 3.30 with her yesterday. Hey, come on, Cindy. It's my day to pick up my kids from daycare. Well, every day is my day to pick up my kids. See you tomorrow, Arthur. Okay. Have fun. I need to go home. I need to go home. I need to go home. I want 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 to go home. It's time to be waiting. I want to go home. Uh, I need to go home. I want to go home. Okay, let's go. Oh, I need to go home. I need to go home now. Miss Caputo, you are home. You live here now. No, it, it's time. My children, they're there. They're going to need Ms. Caputo, dinner. your children are grown. They don't even live around here anymore. No. Hey, there's a movie play. You like movies, right? I bet there's a great movie playing. Let's go see the movie. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, no. let's go I see the movie. I have to go home now. Ms. Caputo, you live here now. I do not live here. I do not live here. Ms. Caputo. I do not live here. Ms. Caputo, you live here now. Let's no, go see the movie. No, I don't. I don't live here. I want to go home. Let's go. You're not going anywhere. Now you're just going to go to your room, okay? You're going with me now, all right? What are you still doing here, Arthur? You get off at three, don't you? Just go. I got her. You can have her. I'm out of here. <sighs> all right. Uh, let me help you with this. Can, can you help me go home? I don't like him. I was looking all over to give you your snack anyway. You ready? I really need to go home. I understand, I Mrs. Caputo. I want to go home. All right. All right. I want to go home. So, what time was it? Three. 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 What time do most kids get out of school? Three. Three. Even though she probably couldn't look at a clock and know for sure that it was three o'clock, she has this sense that it's time, right? Mm -hmm. And her kids need her. And Paco was, he's gonna get out, that's it. If his kids need him, he's getting out. So is Mrs. Caputo. So what are some, what did we see happened? How did Arthur react? He got frustrated. Well, he tried to redirect her and then got frustrated. He tried to redirect her, but then he got frustrated and 
he was trying to do reality orientation with her. Mm -hmm. Your kids don't live, you live here now. Well, this doesn't look like anything she knows or is familiar with. And we've said that home is familiar. So was she having an abnormal behavior? No, no. It it's not abnormal to think that your kids are at home and you need to get there. That's not an abnormal behavior. That's just a normal behavior. We would all do that. So why was she acting like this? What do you think? Let's do a causal analysis of this, a root cause analysis. Why do you think she was acting like this? She was worried about her kids. She was worried about her kids. That seems pretty reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. Where she is in her mind, her reality, her perception is her reality. You will not argue out her, of her, you will not argue her out of it. So her reaction is her kids are at home alone and they need her. So, we have seen an example of a specific and common action of a person with dementia who wants to go home. First of all, we don't like the door locked, do we? You know the code. They can't get out. How does that feel? When you are somewhere that you don't recognize, you believe that you don't belong there, and you can't get out. I guess so. Scary. It would be scary, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? Would you feel kind of like, how did I get here? Who brought me here? Mm -hmm. Did they just drop me off or what? Are they coming back? Because my family would not do this. Okay. So, we need to understand the reasons that cause a person with dementia to act or react in a certain way. We need to look at the, whatever that reaction is and figure out what that reason is. It's not always easy. We have to be kind of detectives. It might be health conditions. It might be medications. There are a lot of medications that cause confusion. It might be our communication to them or it could be family communication, or it could be another elder's communication. It could be the environment. All of this stuff going on, people in and out that we don't know, noises going on, TVs playing. You know, I was working uh, in a facility in North Central, close to an air, a, a base, a military base on 9-11. We had a lot of retiree military, retired military. We had people that did not have a, a severe level of dementia that became much more confused, that were packing because they had to go. They had to go. They had to go. They were being called to go. We finally turned the TV off. The TV, it's amazing that we, that your elders with dementia that TV is as real as you. And so they don't know how to filter it out. So we need to be very careful about the use of the stuff that's going on in the building. Or maybe they hear two nurse aides uh, standing out in the dining room talking about somebody else, but they don't know that and they think you're talking about them, right? could be the task that you're doing. We talked about bathing this morning and how that can be a very, that's a very personal thing, you know? If somebody comes into my room and wants me to take all my clothes off in front of them, I will tell you that the number of people that are, that I am comfortable with seeing me naked is, and you're not on it. It's short and you're not on it. It's getting shorter by the day. You know, we do personal things to people and we just think, well, they understand this is part of what I have to do. No, they don't. They don't understand that. And maybe you don't have to do it that way. Unmet needs. We talked about some, uh, every behavior is communication of an unmet need. Pain is the number one trigger for behaviors. 
hot, cold, hungry, thirsty. Um, what else? Have to go to the bathroom. So, how many of you are involved in three-day voiding diaries? Nurse aides, are you involved in a three-day voiding diary? All the time. Mm -hmm. Well, from that three-day voiding diary comes an individualized toileting plan. Now, let me tell you what is not an individualized toileting plan. <clears throat> Upon awakening, before and after meals and at bedtime, and PRN. That is not an individualized toilet. How many of us in this room right now have that as a toileting plan? No, none of us do, neither do they. Especially if they take Lasix or a laxative or something like that. So maybe the unmet need is they have to go to the bathroom. Audrey Sundaraj, who is the head of the survey agency in Kansas, believes that 90% of falls are related back to toileting. They have to go to the bathroom. They either turn their call light on and nobody comes, and they just have to go more and more and more, and so they get up and go. Or, we didn't plan ahead. So what happens if we would have taken them 30 minutes earlier before they really had to go? They wouldn't fall. Because that unmet need is gone. We've taken care of that. Oral care, bathing, dressing, all of those things are unmet needs. Um, residents' life story. We talked this morning about the things that we need to know about the elder. I know that you all need to know how many people it takes to transfer, do they use a mechanical lift, um, what days do they take a bath, if they're on hospice, all of those task things, but you don't know the real stuff about the elder. You don't know that Matlock would help me. You don't know that tapioca pudding would help me. You don't know that talking about my kids and my grandkids would really help me by name and knowing something about them. Those are the things that will help me if I have dementia. And then you. Is it okay to talk about you to your elders? No? Like what? Your kids. Your kids. What else? I had vacations. Vacations. Certain foods that you like. Foods that you like. Yes. Hobbies. And Hobbies. And yes. What's not all right to talk to them about is, man, I can't make my van payment this month. Mm -hmm. Or I can't, I'm being foreclosed on my house. Those kind of things. They have their own problems. Yeah. So, but yes. You cannot have a relationship, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a relationship with somebody with dementia. You can't have a relationship that only goes one way. You won't have any relationship at all. Okay. Physical and emotional needs, or health conditions, pain, vision and hearing. They didn't hear you. Remember the communication exercise that we did this morning? We didn't understand what the person said. It was frustrating. Maybe they can't hear you. Acute illness, chronic illness, dehydration, constipation, fatigue, anxiety. We've talked about those things, meds. This is very high on the list of, of dementia-related behaviors. Side effects of new meds, any change in the behavior from adjusted dose of current meds. So we have to figure out what the resident is trying to tell us. Were you calm when they were trying to tell you? Were you at eye level? Were you speaking clearly? Now, don't treat them like a child. Don't speak to them like a child. They are not children. Don't ever treat them like a child. The environment, is it too big? You have large dining rooms. A lot of stuff going on in your dining rooms, right? That can be too stimulating. It's not easy to get around. If there's stuff in the way, it may be cluttered, it may be noisy, 
you may not recognize it. One of the things about the facility in the video is that that activity room is big and it's tiled. So there's a lot of echo type sounds. Lots of things, or it may not be lit appropriately. The task. Remember the lady who didn't want to take a bath? That's the task. She didn't want to take a bath. It's not enjoyable. Doesn't feel good when somebody scrubs you as quick as, just as quick as they can. They put you, your clothes back on when you're wet and so your shirt is all wet. They don't dry your hair or for heaven's sake, they don't fix it. It may be painful. Have you thought about that? When your per people are having some sort of dementia related behavior, is the task that you're doing hurting them? Would it be inappropriate to try not to do that task? No. It may be too complicated. More than one step. One step at a time. They may not understand what you said. You may not have said it in a clear and concise way. Not broken down enough. The task isn't familiar to them. They're, they just don't even know what you want. Or it may be too hard. So, unmet needs may be physical or emotional, may be expressed through words instead of, it may be expressed through actions instead of words. Their life story can help you understand. This is about relationships. I don't care if it's post-acute or long-term care. It's about relationships. Who are they? Where did they grow up? Tell me about their uh, the school that they went to, their education, what was their profession, what was their first kiss like, what was their wedding like, tell me about their children. Those kind of things are what will develop a relationship and they're not going to be able to share all those details with you. Who they are, where they came from, what they did, what their family was like. Maybe they didn't have good family life. Maybe they were abused as a child. We need to know that then. And then you. So the person with dementia may be reminded of someone. I know about a case, uh, this facility had a, a, young, a, a fairly significant number of young mentally ill and then they had some long-term care people with dementia. And they had a situation where a 45-year-old man was um, having active sex with an 83-year-old lady with dementia. She could not consent. So they called the family, and the family brought in a picture of her husband. It could have been this man her, her husband, would, 40 years before that, it could, this man could have been. So she was having sex with her husband. So they had to do some changing because it was they could not allow that to happen. They may be reacting to your actions. They may be reacting to feelings. Do you think your people with, with uh, dementia are ever afraid? Mm -hmm. What are they afraid of? The unknown. The unknown. What else? They don't know what you're trying to do. When you're trying to change them, they think you should take their clothes off. Right. They don't know what you're trying to do. What else? Not a familiar face. You're not like family to them. You're, you're not family to them. Mm -hmm. Are they, do they ever have, they're, they're afraid they're going to run out of money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, oftentimes we will hear, well, I can't go to dinner because I don't have any money, honey. Now, remember their long, and so what do you say to that? It's taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember their long-term memory is their strong memory, their short-term memory is their weakest memory. How often in your life right now does somebody say to you, it doesn't matter that you don't have the money, it's taken care of? Not very often. No, <laughs> maybe once in a while, yeah. maybe, but not very often. Here's the term they do know, room and board. They know that term. It's in their long-term memory, room and board. So maybe you say to them, your room and board was paid. And they will say, oh, okay. 
use the terms that are familiar. Are any of them ever afraid to die? How many of you know how your elders want to die? No, I'm not talking about funeral plans, things like that. I'm talking about what do they want when they're dying? Peaceful. Yeah, maybe. Have you asked them? Good. Good. Be at home with their family. Yeah, in their sleep. Yeah, in their sleep. So, I went to a, a, ses a seminar in San Antonio, Texas, a number of years ago, and they had a session on finding out what your elders want when they die. Man, it was kind of, it was an emotional type of session. Uh, my husband was traveling with me. He was out golfing while I was at the session, and we got back to the room about the same time. And I was tearful but not crying. And... So I said, okay, here's the deal, Carl. I want to be at home in my own bed. And I want the boys there, but I don't want the boys in the room with me because I was there for my mom and it was just awful. But I want them in the other room and I want to hear them laughing. And I want my dog right here. And I want you here holding my hand. And you can have music, but don't make it country. <laughs> and, and by that time, I'm crying. And he looked at me and he said, where the heck have you been? <laughs> but then you know what he did? He wrote it down. So I came back to my facility. They hated it when I went to seminars because I always came back with this stuff. I was teaching an ADSSD class at the time. So I said to my ADSSD peeps, you're going to go out and you're going to find out what they want when they're dying. And they go, and I said, and off they went. You know what we found out? One lady wanted the window up about this far so her spirit could go out. One lady wanted Elvis. We had Elvis. One lady wanted one daughter and not the other. Yikes. So we had a conversation with the family. We called them in. We had a conversation. They seemed to understand it. <laughs> it wasn't a big surprise. So when she was actively dying, we brought they were both there, one was not in the room. One lady wanted to be held while she was dying. So the nurse aide that was it responsible for, she started, this was six to eight months later, she started into the active dying process. Her daughter, who had visited every day, was very involved, was out of town. Mm -hmm. So we got her on the way back. And the nurse aide who had done the interview and who had built the relationship we told her you're going to go take care of her today that's all you're going to do we're going to cover for the rest of it so her shift ended before the lady had died she went home she took a shower and when the daughter walked in the room the nurse aide was lying in the bed holding her that's what relationships are about she knew her elder so well that she knew what she wanted. That's where, do you think the daughter was endeared to us forever? Yes. Do you think it helped the elder? Yeah, yeah we gave her what she asked for. Do you think it helped the nurse aid? Yeah. It absolutely did. She didn't care what she made that day. She only cared she'd made a difference. Okay, so we need to understand the reasons for their behaviors. When we understand the reasons behind someone's actions, then we can respond to their needs. We can meet their needs, right? I have to go to the bathroom. If you'll take me in there, I'll feel better. If I'm having pain and you give me a Tylenol, I'll feel better. I won't have that agitated feeling. Every person has different reasons, and every person might need a different response. You think? We don't all have the same needs. Being with a person with dementia means understanding things from that elder's perspective, not from yours. 
understanding the elder's perspective. Hey, what time you got, Arthur? Ten minutes. It's almost that time. Oh, thank goodness. If you told me it was one, I think I'd just collapse. I'm so beat. Kind of like yesterday, huh? And the I day before that, home. yep. I have to go home. It's your turn. Sorry, I was here till 3.30 with her yesterday. Come on, Cindy. It's my day to pick up my kids from daycare. Well, every day is my day to pick up my kids. See you tomorrow, Arthur. Okay. Have fun. I need to go home. I need to go home. I need to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Uh -huh. I want to go home. I want to go home. It's time to be waiting. I want to go home. Okay, let's go. Oh, I need to go home. I need to go home now. Miss Caputo, you are home. You live here now. No, it, it's time. My children, they're there. They're going to need Miss Caputo, dinner. your children are grown. They don't even live around here anymore. No. Hey, there's a movie play. You like movies, right? I bet there's a great movie playing. Let's go see the movie. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, no. let's go I see the movie. I have to go home now. Miss Caputo, you live here now. I do not live here. I do not live here. Miss Caputo. I do not live here. Miss Caputo, you live here now. Let's no, go see the movie. No, I don't. I don't live here. I want to go home. I want to go home. I don't live here. Let's go. Yeah, you're not going anywhere. Here. Now you're just going to go to your room, OK? You're going with me now, all right? Home. What are you still doing here, Arthur? You get off at 3, don't you? Just go. I got her. You can have her. I'm out of here. <sighs> all right. Uh, let me help you with this. Can, can you help me go home? I don't like him. I was looking all over to give you your snack anyway. You ready? I really need to go home. I understand, I Mrs. Caputo. I want to go home. I wanna go home. All right. All right. I want to go home. So what are some of the reasons Mrs. Caputo might be saying she wants to go home? Kids. Kids. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and her kids were. She, she thought her kids were there. She needed to take care of them. What are some things that the resident might mean when they want to go home? Your residents. What might they mean? You ever have that? They're scared. They don't trust us. They're scared. They don't trust you. It takes a long time to build a relationship, doesn't it? A trusting relationship. It takes seeing the same person every day. It's, not, it's consistent caregiving so that you're, the same people are, are building that trust every day, not a new face every day. They see so many new faces. They're tired of the routine. They're tired of the routine. What, tell me some other things that, besides the snack that might have helped. Taking them to their room that they have there and showing them like familiar pictures or yes. the blanket or something there. So what we know is her short-term memory is her weakest, her long-term memory is her strongest. We need to talk to her about some pictures, don't we? Mm -hmm. How Do you all have mirrors in the rooms? Mm -hmm. So the, remember their long-term memory is the strongest. So the person, they don't recognize the person in the mirror. I'm not that old. That's not me. Lots of places are now either taking the mirror down or they are putting a photo of the elder 40 years ago in there. Tell me how it would feel if somebody took you in a bathroom, started to take your clothing down, and there was a strange person in there. I wouldn't do it. I'm just telling you right now, I am not undressing in front of a person I don't recognize. And that's who that is in that mirror. You have to be very careful about the use of mirrors when you're working with dementia folks. Think about that. Think about maybe showing them pictures of 
of her kids, who is who, what she, when they were children, would be enough to, and have her talk about it. You're going to learn some things, and she's going to feel better. Okay, so we discussed the reasons behind the actions and the reactions of a person with dementia. So let's talk about some ways to respond. We're going to provide examples of ways to respond to actions of people with dementia. So what we know is we have an action and we need, before we know how to respond, we need to know why they're having that. Is there anything we can do? Is anybody in danger? Because sometimes the answer is to walk away, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Leave them alone and come back later because their short-term memory is their weakest. They will have forgotten it in a little bit. Come back and approach them in a different way. Maybe it's a different person, whatever. So we need to prepare, we need to prevent, and we need to be present. How can, tell me some ways that we can be present. Focusing solely on them. Focusing solely on them. They get all of your attention. It may not be a long interaction, but while you're interacting, you're focusing on them. You're not paying attention to the people across the room or the stuff that's going, or for heaven's sake, your cell phone. Okay, great. Great, anybody else have ideas about how we can be present? Turning the TV off so it's more one-on-one. -on -one. Perfect. Because remember, that's stimulating. That's just causing stimulation. Okay, so preparing. Knowing this person will act or react in a particular way. Are there some things that you can do to prepare yourself or other staff members to respond to the action? So if you know that um, turning rock music on for me would make me more agitated. Maybe you better share that with someone else so that they don't do the same thing, right? Right? Yes. Okay. So, um, where would we do that? We put it um, while you're charting. You can make a note of it. Mm -hmm. Care plan. The care plan should say that Linda responds with agitated behaviors when rap music is on. Pretty simple, isn't it? Because you don't want, first of all, you don't want somebody else to go through what you're going through right now. And second of all, you don't want me to go through that. Right? Okay, do I need to ensure that I'm available to the person with dementia at a certain time of day? What we know is 3 o'clock is a sensitive time of day for Mrs. Caputo, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So maybe we'd better have a care plan that at 3 o'clock we're doing something of meaning to her to get her diverted away from this behavior. And then do I need to tell others about it? Yes, you do, and you need to do it via the care plan. How could this act prevent? We need to figure out how we can prevent it. It may happen once, but we need to figure out how to prevent it from happening again. How can you redirect the person? What is it that will divert this person away from this that's causing them distress? Is there some need, unmet need, that we're not meeting? What seems to trigger the action? For Mrs. Caputo, first of all, it was the time. It was 3 o'clock. Second of all, it became the caregiver. I don't like him. I guarantee you she will remember that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to figure it out. Then be present. How can you respond to the immediate need of this person? We've talked about how to be present. How can you be with them? How can you redirect them? How can you remove the source of frustration? You're not going to remove the fact that she thinks at 3 o'clock she needs to be home. So how are you going to remove the frustration from that? And then how can you make sure she's safe? Because she might just um, put her hand through that glass. I mean, people don't like to be locked in places.
Hey, Miss Caputo. It's me, Maria. I've been looking for you. For me? Yeah, um, I kind of need your help with the cooking class. My help? Yeah, your food is delicious, and you're one of the best cooks here. <laughs> come on, you want to come with me? Okay, okay. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So prior to the time that they knew she gets agitated, they diverted her into something else that was of interest to her. Was it a positive reaction? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely it was. Hey, Mrs. Caputo. It's me, Gloria. I need to get home. Yes, I understand. I need to get home now. Mrs. Caputo, I just came to give you your purse. Okay. okay. I need to go home. The painting class is about to start. Why don't we go see? We need you. No. I need to go home. You know, I need some fresh air. May I walk with you? Okay. 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 I need to go home. Let's walk. What a beautiful day. The sky is so blue. <laughs> Look at the pretty roses. I love that color. Do you? Yeah, I, I like it. I lo what color is that? Rose? Yeah. Red? Yeah, yeah, red, yeah. Oh my, it's almost time for dinner. Are you hungry? Yes, I am hungry. <laughs> I know they're serving lasagna tonight. Lasagna is my favorite. Lasagna is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get some lasagna? OK. Oh, good. All right. Tell me about your daughters. My daughters. I have four little girls. So. Do you ever walk out with them? In the court, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even out the front door? Yeah. I, I taught dementia uh, up in northwestern Kansas and they had a truck driver. They admitted him, he had dementia, and he decided he, I mean, he's on the move all the time. That's how he'd been all of his life. life. And um, he decided he would walk three miles to the cemetery and they were right behind him. They, they talked to him during the walk, they, but they didn't say, no, you can't do that. Because not very many people in his life had ever said that, and they lived to tell the story. <laughs> so they got him a logbook, because truckers know about logbooks. And so every time they walked with him, they logged it. He was happy. He didn't feel frustrated. He didn't feel like he was in prison. You hear that? This is just a prison, this is a jail. Well, if the door is locked and you can't get out, then yes, it is a jail, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you're doing it for their safety. It's like physical restraints used to be. When I first got in this business, um, we used physical restraints on nearly everybody we had because we couldn't let them fall. We didn't want them to fall. That's not the right thing, is it? Yeah. We tied people to the handrail with gate belts. Yeah. Okay. So one size does not fit all. The cat, for people that are sexually aggressive, will not work for everybody. You have to individualize it to the care and the needs and the life story of each elder. And something may work for one person and doesn't work for another. That ever happen? We just realize. Here's what I... Do you like everybody you work with? I mean, like them? No. Neither do they. Neither do your elders. There are people they relate better to, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do you think they like everybody at their table? No. No. So move them. Or have them move. Get them to talk them into trying some a different table. Because they have personalities. Their heart is still the same. 
you have to fix the, the you have to adapt the action to the behavior. So what happens when something gets out of control? We saw examples of ways to respond. And probably telling them, you can't go outside. You can't go outside. No, you can't go outside. It will not work. OK, so we're going to brainstorm. We've already done this, basically, on some actions of people with dementia. We have to figure out the why. So why did the resident do not want to take the bath? And what are some ways to respond to them? I can't believe it. Oh, God. Take the damn. Yank it. Three to two to the tiger. For they don't even know what the they got nothing. They got in the Bronx Hi, of Wilson. all places. They it's lose me, to Gloria. a team May like I come the in? Tigers are nothing, man. They, you know, they got what's with the Yankees? They got no pitching. They got they got no. Where's Mantle? Where's Mary? I don't even know why the hell they're not even all ready for you, just the way what? you like it. Who? It's me, Gloria. Who the hell are you? I don't know you. Get the. What do you want? Okay. No, I don't even know okay. you. Get out of here. Get okay. out of here. Okay, Mr. Say, you guys, I, get I'm out. Sorry. I don't No. Go away. No bath. Uh, okay. No, no. No. Go away. Hmm. Hmm. Leave me alone. I don't want nothing out of here. Get out of here. Who the? I don't know. Yankees. Hey, Dave. Three. Dude. Will you please see if Mr. Johnson will let you give him his Jeez. bath today and I'll give Mrs. Garner her bath? Mm. I'll take care of Mr. Johnson. Mm. Oh, mm. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, what? Hey, it's me, Dave. Uh, Can I come in? Huh? I don't know what. I can't even, you know, the time. Damn. Stand at my crap sake. I don't know where the hey, they got. They me, even Dave. won. Okay today? The Yankees lost. Three to two. They. Dave. Dave. You remember me? Dave! You haven't forgot Dave. about me already, man? Yeah! Hey, man, yeah, know. yeah, thanks. About some Yankees. Yeah, they lost. Three to two. Uh, don't tell me that. Yeah, to the, to the bloody Tigers, for crap's sake. They can't even win a game against a, two billion dollar a no payroll. nothing team. They couldn't even beat the Dodgers. Yeah, I tell you what, it's time for your bath today. You mind if I take you? I don't, what? I said, you mind if I take you to your bath today? Yeah. Oh, the, let's do bath, it. yeah. Bath. About that time. Bath, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, what yeah. happened to this? They can't beat the Dodgers even, you know. Yeah. They, they, they might as well not even go to Brooklyn. They, couldn't, the they couldn't win the series. Oh, you think no. it's the Which it's one? time to get rid of Stengel. He ain't doing yeah. jack. Okay, so how did Gloria respond to Mr. Johnson's refusal? Frustration. Frustration. Yeah. So how did Mr. Johnson then react? He got even more mad. Yeah, he, he got even more, more mad. That's exactly right. That looks great, Mr. Davidson. I'm going to go sit with Mrs. Wilson for a minute, okay? No. Okay. Hi, Mrs. Wilson. I love your collection of buttons. What are you working on today? Is that your special one? I'll be very careful with it. It's a beautiful button. I love that. Hi, Mr. Davidson. Mm -hmm. What about this one? That's a really pretty one, too, isn't it? I wonder if we could use that for your project. Look at all of these beautiful buttons that Mrs. Wilson is using for her project. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I especially love the button that you picked out. Maybe we should put that back with the rest of Mrs. Wilson's buttons? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You look a little hungry, Mr. Davidson. Would you like a snack? <laughs> OK. I'll be right back, Mrs. Wilson. OK? It's all right. I'll be right back. So do you think he was hungry? Mm -hmm. Very well. Probably was. Probably was.
chances if they had it against the Miami Heat to begin with. It was a busy night in the world. Hey Dave, Mr. Davidson's son Paul and the nurse explained to me why Mr. Davidson is always borrowing my dad's sneakers. Good, I didn't know. It's if... okay. They told me the whole story. Paul said that his dad was quite the athlete when he was younger. He used to play all kinds of sports. So the nurse says that when he sees other men's sneakers, he honestly thinks they're his, so he takes them and puts them on or puts them in his room. It all makes sense now. I'm sorry I seemed accusatory before. I just didn't understand then. Hey, look, I'm, I'm glad you understand. Thanks. So, there was a reason for the behavior. A reason, and that's where we have to get to. We have to look at what the reason for the behavior is. So, we learned that we can respond to the actions of people with dementia. I'm so glad you picked it out yes. because I haven't seen mm -hmm. it yet on anybody. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's that beautiful. Oh, yeah. Cupcake sales is ending in 15 minutes. We'll do a second coat and that way we'll make sure that the yes. color sets really well for you. Yes. Okay. Oh, you have gorgeous hands. Come on, everybody. Come to the staff and bring them to buy some cupcakes oh, for a good cause. They're going fast. It's coming in. It's coming in. It's coming in. We gotta get out of here. Mr. Hayes. It's coming in. We gotta go. Get ready. Get ready. Mr. Hayes. It's coming in. No. Now. No. Are you okay? No. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. It's okay. How's your arm? It hurts a little. Does it hurt a little bit? All right. Let's calm down a minute, and we, you and I, will go see a nurse. Okay? We'll let her look at it to make sure you're all right. All right. No, he has no family. I know that he lived with his wife for many years and she took care of them in their home and she brought him to our adult day program a few days a week. I asked the manager June and she said that he was so far into his own world that he no longer remembered his wife, but they were getting along okay at home until her fatal car accident a year ago and that's when he came to live here. So no kids? Mm -mm. Okay. So when did this behavior start? Um, let's see. I don't get it. It, it seems to be getting worse. Okay. Well, I couldn't ex understand exactly what he was saying, combing, come in. But it all happened so quickly to go from sanding a few birdhouses to, to pulling on Mrs. Crandall's arm so hard that it reduced her to sobbing. I called my friend at the adult day center where Mr. Haynes used to go, mm -hmm. and, and she said it doesn't sound like him at all. Well, what was he like when he was there? Well, he was calm and quiet, what you'd expect from a 66-year-old accountant. But she did say that he was becoming very disoriented to time and place, and, and even to who his wife was. I think his behavior has been worsening with time, with no real indication as to why. Have there been a change in meds? No. Any strokes? No. Has he been in pain? No, not that I'm aware of. And then there was a time a few months back when Sandra, third shift, mm -hmm. well, Sandra walked in on him sitting next to this man in his 30s who was here for rehab. And she said Mr. Haynes was sitting with him, holding his wrist. And then maybe he was trying to take his pulse or something. But when she tried to get him back into bed, he was really insistent about needing to stay there. 
it ended up waking up that guy and caused this really big scene. Oh, he's such a nice man. You know, this seems to have all started just out of the blue this past month. Have you guys had any out of the ordinary experiences recently with Mr. Haynes? Yes, we checked for UTI, dehydration. We looked at everything. There were six different incidents in the last month, all involving other residents and some involving aggression towards staff. Okay, well, it seems there's no choice. One milligram of Risperdal, and let's start it today. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Knox. You're welcome. Well, this isn't bad like yours today. It was really very sweet. Remember when we had the Boy Scouts in a few weeks ago and they had to interview an older person for a badge? Well, the Scout leader wanted each of the boys in the troop to talk to several residents instead of interview just one. Every time one of the boys walked past Mr. Haynes, he saluted him. Now, a couple of them looked at him weird, but two boys stopped and saluted him back. It was really sweet. Excuse me. Yeah, Lucas? I couldn't help but overhear you talking about Mr. Haynes. Mm-hmm. Is it okay if I share something about Mr. Haynes? Well, sure. Can I grab a chair? Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah, come on. Well, you, you know he likes to follow me around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've noticed. He seems to like your company. Well, yeah, I, I like his company too. But everything you're saying about Mr. Haynes, saluting young boys in uniform, wanting to take care of a young man and take his, uh, take his pulse. Even today, with the, they're coming, they're coming, it all makes sense. What do you mean it all makes sense? One day, Mr. Haynes was helping me water the flowers up on the patio, and he got his shirt all wet. So I helped him change his shirt, and he had the exact same tattoo as my uncle. When I was younger, I asked my uncle about his tattoo. He told me it's the kind of tattoo those only medics have. My uncle was a medic at a mass army unit in Vietnam. Mr. Haynes was a medic. Wait, I don't get how what happened today has anything to do with that. I think I do. I think I do. The overhead paging is like the announcements on the loudspeakers at a MASH camp during the war. Right. MASH, the TV show? Oh, She's been. so young, you probably never even saw the no. show. <laughs> okay, anyway. Well, if he was a medic, hey. normally, the announcements on the loudspeakers would tell the whole camp that injured soldiers were coming in. Today's reaction happened right after there was an announcement on the overhead. His reaction was totally normal when you think about it. He needed for us to go and get prepped so that we could help the injured soldiers that were coming in. And the young guy who is here for rehab well, I suppose if in his mind uh, he was back at the age that he was in Vietnam, the guy in rehab was around the same age in Mr. Haynes' mind. Mm. So maybe Mr. Haynes wasn't doing anything but making sure that the guy in rehab was okay. Right. So, Lucas, what do you do if he reacts aggressively or violently when you're with him? Mr. Haynes? Mm. He never does. He might get a little excited, but you just have to imagine you're in his shoes. Be in his world. React mm. to his feelings. Be with him. Makes total sense when you think about it. Yeah. You have to make a phone call. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lucas. I mean, that is very insightful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we'll get back to work. Hi, Dr. Knox. It's Julie Molina. I'm glad you're still here. We have some new insight into the behavior of Mr. Haynes. Would you consider delaying the antipsychotic med we talked about? Okay, 
I'll come to your office now and explain what we've learned. again excellent and then we're going to drop them down to our side we're going to stretch our necks a little bit we're going to look over to the right don't force anything just a nice easy stretch and as you come back to the center then good we're going to stretch over come to on the down to the activity back. room very good all right it's okay corporal haynes corporal haynes it's okay it's okay it's all right, we don't have to go anywhere. They don't need us today. We get to stay right here. Corporal Haynes, it's okay. We can stay here today. They don't need us today, okay? Very good, very good. You are doing great today, Mrs. Wilson. I just had to let you know that. And so are you. All of you are doing an excellent job today, okay? Now we have our heads facing forward. This time we're gonna drop our chins down to our chest. Very good, let the back of that neck stretch a little bit. We have to go to where they are. It wasn't an abnormal behavior. What's one thing that sticks out? How they all got together and shared their experiences with each other to find mm -hmm. out what was going on. So the maintenance man is the one who had the key. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this building has the answers. You never know. Okay, so in this module you learned about reframing behaviors, understanding the reasons behind actions, and identifying ways to respond to actions. Any questions or comments? Okay.